boats. If there was 30, 30 foot waves out there, there's not a whole lot gonna save anybody, you know, in a lifeboat. First things first, the Coast Guard insists we inform everyone the location of all life preservers before getting out into the lake. Today certainly be no exception. The radars were inoperative. Uh, Whitefish Point, you've been up there. That big, beautiful light had been blown out. The wind was blowing so hard, hurricane strength wind, that they couldn't keep the generators going if they lost the electricity. So welcome back to season three with Captain Darrell. <laughs> nice to be here. Thanks for having me. It's yeah, nice. yeah, no, it's, it's been great. Uh, the videos we've done together have been incredibly well received. Uh, most views ever out of anything I've ever done so but I wanted to do just a little quick review uh, for those that didn't see season one or two if they were to jump in now it's worth noting that you have a direct connection to the Edmund Fitzgerald your uncle Grant Walton Ralph Grant Walton uh, your father's brother yep. was an oiler on the Edmund Fitzgerald yep. and went down with the ship when it sank November 10th 1975 correct so and just a quick review we know that the Edmund Fitzgerald departed uh, Superior Wisconsin just after two o'clock about 2 15 November 9th uh, we have fairly well extensively covered uh, the Arthur M Anderson's role in the Fitzgerald because uh, later that night November 10th at about 2 a.m. The Fitzgerald and the Anderson talked on the radio and agreed to mirror each other across the lake and with the wind at the time uh, coming from the northeast, unfortunately for the Fitzgerald, it would change direction to the south and eventually northwest, which didn't help at all. Uh, but, but based on the wind direction at the time, they agreed to follow a more northerly route. And we know that at 3.30 p.m. on November 10th, the Fitzgerald called the Anderson at reporting damage. Fence rail down, two vent covers were blown off, and the ship was now listing significantly, meaning that it was taking on water. So uh, no, knowing that the, all the ballast pumps were running, it wasn't enough, uh, or so it seems. And then at 4.10 p.m., the Fitzgerald requests navigational help from the Anderson because now both radars are gone and they're out. Now we're getting down to it because uh, we know at 6 p.m., the Anderson, as told by Captain Cooper, was struck by a 25 to 30 foot rogue wave uh, that surely was coming toward the uh, Fitzgerald which was still 10 miles in front of the Anderson um, and then at 7 p.m. the Anderson calls the Fitzgerald and asks the question how are you making out with your problems and then the last known transmission from the Fitz about 710 uh, the last words from Captain McSorley of the Fitzgerald we are holding our own and then about a quarter after seven, it disappears from radar. The Edmund Fitzgerald is gone. But the part of the script that we haven't talked about yet is the role of the Wilfred Sykes, who weathered the same storm, at least for a time. Uh, it also played a role. How does the Wilfred Sykes fit into this <clears throat> whole thing? Well, as you said, <clears throat> the Fitz burning at Northern Dock Number 1 or Superior left at 2.15. At that same dock, right across the slip there, was a wolf of Sykes loading the same kind of cargo. So they were loading at the same time the exact in same the same time. harbor. Yeah, the same Sykes exact and slip. The Fitzgerald. You know, Fitzgerald's here and the Sykes is here. <clears throat> and uh, he watched them load them, and uh, the Fitzgerald left, and he was one of the last people, one of the last people on this planet to watch that Fitzgerald leave and uh, meet its uh, rendezvous with destiny, if you don't mind my saying that. And he watched the crew members putting the hatch covers on, but he could not, was too far away to tell if they were actually dogging him down, could not tell that, okay? He ended up leaving at 4.15. Two hours after right. the Fitzgerald. Now, for remember, Bernie Cooper had left two harbors, Steve, but he was a slower boat. And the Fitzgerald, a couple hours later, caught up with him. So now you've got the Fitzgerald in the lead. You got the Anderson right behind him. You got the Wilford Sykes behind him and the Roger Blau behind the Wilford Sykes. Now, Captain Dudley, however you say his last name, Picardy, however you say it, Paquette. Okay, it's Paquette. 
he was the weatherman of that fleet. I mean, he had been to actual weather school to learn how to do this. Not like these meteorologists on TV. You know, they just read off a teleprompter. They don't know their butt from home or ground weather-wise, you know. But this guy knew it. And he said, this, they're going to have a heck of a storm here because the weather service said it's going to all pass south of Lake Superior. Don't worry. Nothing to worry about here. And the captain of the site said, uh-uh, it's going to hit right in the middle of Lake Superior. And at the time, I believe he was the only one saying that. Because, exactly. as you mentioned, this storm was, was they, they could see it was building, it could be a severe storm, but it was going to safely pass below Lake Superior right. and they should be okay, which is probably why they set out to begin with. But Sykes had a different opinion. He thought the, the storm was going to strike dead center. Well, because of his <clears throat> prognosticating abilities weather-wise, he hugged the North Shore there of Canada. And when it got so bad... He says, this is nuts. He says, I'm out of here. And he goes and drops the hook. He anchors behind Isle Royale until she blew herself out. But by that time, as you noted, the wind was changing direction. Now, when we get a picture of that chart, chart later on, Doug Spirit chart, the way the wind was blowing, had they gone the regular route around the Keweenaw Peninsula by Key, uh, Copper Harbor, they'd have been Whitefish Point way before 7 o'clock. You mean a more southerly route? Exactly. The Lake Carriers Association has these approved routes. You go, okay? But instead, they go all the way up north. And as luck would have it, or as bad luck would have it, that's where the two low-pressure systems converged into this monstrous storm. And Captain yeah. Perquet said that that he overheard a conversation. Now, remember, he's been out there running this same route for years and years. He's heard Captain Cooper, Captain McShorley talk. They've talked. He's talked to him. And he heard something he never heard before. He heard McShorley call Cooper and say, hey, he says, I've had to check back my speed from 99 RPM to 55 RPM. Now, this is an 18 and a half foot diameter prop, right? At 99 RPM, that's full tilt boogie, man. We are boogieing down the highway at 16 and a half mile an hour. Anderson's going about 14 miles an hour. And he asked, have you checked back? He says, yes, I've checked back from 99 RPM to 85 RPM. So now they're both doing about eight or nine mile an hour. And, and Captain McShorley said, I've never seen this boat act like this. It's never moved this much. That's why I had to check. I can't, still can't say the guys. Paquette, are you going to know? Paquette, I get Paquette. Paquette. Okay. I was in the service with Sergeant Picotti. You spell oh, almost the oh, same no, way, see? No wonder Chief you're all Manuel. twisted. I'm having trouble there. And just <laughs> uttering his name, I get a shudder up my spine, you know. Ooh, yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it reminds me of the captain on the James A. Hand of the tug I worked on. Uh, I was loafing on the stern one day, laying in a, a coil of rope line, and I didn't know he was coming. He came up and kicked me and said, hey, what do you just think this is, a, 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 a yacht? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, no, no, sir, I don't think it's a yacht, and I, I suppose I ought to get to work. <laughs> I'm just going to refer to him as a captain from now on. All right, carry on, carry on. So. He said he never heard him utter those words before. All those years... McCharley went full tilt boogie. He never checked back for anybody. And and um, when I talk about second officer Lytower in a little bit on the Titanic, the only surviving, surviving senior member, he said, as ships got bigger, it does not necessarily mean they got stronger. Now, we know that there were, and it's in the official Coast Guard report, some of these guys said when they'd go into certain waves, the bow would just bend just like this. The rest of the ship's going straight. And they'd have a heck of a time getting it back and then bend this way. That's got to be the creepiest thing, watching your ship. Oh, I can't. Bend, I'm, I can't. And, even, and oh. the noise that would come from that is would be eerie beyond the world. But he was a company man. He's going to go in it because he figured it's a new ship. Hey, uh, it's going to hold together. But he even said, this thing scares me sometimes, and I hope I'm never in a bad storm with this thing. McSorley said that. That's that why they six. ordered him and Cooper altered course to go up north. And, well, what, and you said Paquette, of the captain of the psych, said I had never heard McSorley check back for anything. Never, not once in all the years he'd been out. But he was now. He was now. It's like the fear of God's in him now, you know. And and the captain of the sex, Paquette, I'm getting I'm getting the hang of it now. He said he thought she was starting to break up out in the middle of Lake Superior. Now, the reason I don't agree with that is because he made a weather report a little bit later on, you know, and gave a weather report to the National Weather Service. And if he was breaking apart at the time, uh, I think he might have said something to somebody. And he didn't say nothing. He never said a word till they got up there and they made the turn down by Mitchapotten Island there and Caribou Shoal. And that's when he reported the trouble. Now, 
If I may, I'm going to say something here. A slight sidebar. And for you folks in TV land, this is very important. Take notes, please. There is a YouTube video out there called I Welded on the Fitzgerald. Okay? Really? Worked at the River Rouge plant where they should come in there and she's doing her gig. And they'd get him on board and start welding. He says the, the uh, he, he called most of it minor, not all, but most of it was minor. The window hatch frames in the in the bow in the in the pilot house would bust. They just bust right out. He had to re weld them all up. That's how much this, this this boat was twisting and flexing, you know. And now here's the kicker, folks. Here's the kicker. Hold on to your hats. It's gonna be a rough ride. He said it on them hatch covers, you'd have to take a sledgehammer and try to get them down on there like this, okay? So they didn't fit properly? Nah, because of the twisting All and the, the flexing. It's like turn. a door, you know, in the summertime with the heat and you can't yeah. use door jams on you. Listen, my favorite job on them lake footers was running that hatch cover crane. Oh, buddy, I love that job. Because it's like a big railroad train, you know? It's on railroad wheels, on railroad tracks. You know, and you turn it and you lift the, set them down. Never, not once, did I ever have one of them jam and you need to have a sledgehammer put it down. So they had a lot of things going on there. Now, if that picture that you took there mm -hmm. on his book of, of the, those casting um, and, yeah, and I want to I want to fill these people in on this. There's 68. They're called Kessner clamps. They're Kessner two foot clamps. centers. Kessner with a K. Uh, it's five sixteenths of an inch stiff in the plate, with a nine sixteenths inch rubber gasket around them, and they weigh tons. I'm talking about the actual hatches now. Okay. The, the Kessner clamps that hatch that. that Right, they're like a big C clamp. You know? Okay, you put it in and boom, jam them down. If you look at that picture, you will notice, and this is the Fitzgerald on the bottom, buddy. There's only three of those Kessner clamps on the corners, the rest of them are untouched. They look like the day they were made. And I say to you, the Fitz, I mean, the uh, Coast Guard, I think, was right in a couple of areas that bottomed out at Caribou Shoal, but part of it was because the imploding of the hatch covers. You cannot blame the crew on this. They had all Lake Superior go across to tighten these down. You know why they didn't tighten them down? You couldn't tighten them down because they were all whipper jawed. It wasn't like they w were immune to work and wouldn't go out and do the job, but you couldn't do if the job. If you're getting your ass kicked on, on, you know, hey, let's go out there and make sure this, this baby's dog down here, you know? But they physically couldn't dog them down because they did the hatch covers didn't Because they fit. wouldn't fit. That's what this guy who wrote on said, and he said it real cryptically. See, if you listen to it a couple of times, you know, he's, he's like CYA, you know, he's covering his butt. But that is why they weren't dogged down. And when you when, when Captain Cooper said you got a couple of big waves coming your way, Captain Cooper's hatch cover crane was completely underwater. This thing's six, eight feet deep, you know. And when it came down, because those hatches weren't, if here's the hatch, right? And you've only got a dog down on the corners because that won't fit any other way. And that way, oh, boom, she just went just like that. And all Collapsed. that water. So do not blame the crew for that. They couldn't dog them down. You know whose fault that is? So. Sid Spinner, okay. Now, who is he? Uh, 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 Kratzer of Columbia Transportation Company and Dick Feltz. They're the, ones that did, they're the ones that did the final inspection with the Coast Guard October 31st, uh, 1975. I'll never forget that day because it's my birthday. Yeah, it's my birthday. You're, you're a Halloween baby? Ooh. <laughs> hey, I was born to a doctor slap no my mother. I'm you know? scared. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my wife threw me this wonderful birthday party. We lived at this horse farm up in Michigan, and we just had the greatest time. But they left, and they go, well, there's nothing to say. This is minor stuff, minor stuff, no problem. So they go unloaded up to Duluth. They load another cargo. Weather's good, no problem. Come all the way back down unload they go back up for the 30th trip and obviously their last trip and as they load and come back down you see the hatches weren't done you know why because they were damaged clear back then and they were going to go well we'll fix these because they're going back to dry dock they're going to go back to superior and they had they had in the hole there, there they were going to add to it on the list they, it was to they repair were, they, the fits they, they were going to add another section to it they like the anderson was lengthened and my old man, my dad was chief engineer in the Armco when they lengthened the, the Armco. Because he had all this extra paper. They had sensors where the welds were and stuff, you know, to see if, you know, how she's doing. So they were going to reattach the keel, 
they were going to add a complete bulkhead, not a screen bulkhead, because she was twisting and flexing so much. That's why you couldn't shut the, the hatches. And they were, have no doubt, repaired those hatches at that time or taken a run at it, yeah? That's what they were going to do then, but they probably said, well, you're going to we'll just... just wait to go dry dock in the winter. That's, and we'll that's take right. take care of it all at once. Exactly. But they didn't include that in the report. But you can see it on the bottom of the lake. They're not dogged down. And they didn't have any bad weather on that la on the second to last trip. I mean, you could say, well, you know, they got all screwed up. But no, it was good weather. But coming down then, they hit all that bad weather. They weren't dug down properly. So so to, when Gordon Lightfoot even changed that lyric of that song, at 7 p.m., a name halfway came in, you know. He took that out because he didn't want the crew to get blamed for that. Hey, Gordon, no problem, pal. They couldn't dog them down. I am certain of that. I've been studying this thing for years. They don't just magically, uh, the, the crew would never put up with that. And that's why when he was talking to Cedric Woodrick of the Averforce, uh, he was a pilot on the Averforce. Your dad was a pilot, wasn't he? He was. He okay. Was a foreign ships pilot. Yep. And he's on a, he's on a radio telephone with Charlie. And uh, that's when he heard the hot microphone, hey, don't let nobody out on deck. Because they knew they were taking water and they knew this. There ain't a doubt in my mind. You know, I've never seen such seas. Yeah, I'm getting lower and lower here. That's why. Yeah, yeah. So uh, do not blame the crew is what I'm saying. You can't dog down something because of the maintenance was wrong on it. You, it you mentioned right. the Avafors, uh, a, a Swedish ship, which was a foreign ship, uh, one of the last to communicate with the Edmund Fitzgerald when the, the, the pilot on the Avafors overheard Captain McSorley say, as you mentioned, don't let anybody out on deck, nobody out on deck. Uh, he, he also heard him say, I have a bad list, both radars are out, and I'm taking heavy seas over the deck. He didn't say onto the deck, he said over the deck. Uh, one of the worst storms I've ever been in. Uh, I, I would say it was the worst storm Captain McSorley was, was ever in because he was the heavy weather captain of the Great Lakes. Nothing kept him at the dock, or rarely would he stay at the dock for weather. Uh, but boy, he knew he was in trouble. Well, I'll tell you one thing, for every, now we know she was overloaded at 27 feet, six inches back after and 27 feet, two inches up forward. 